Thank you very much, Honorable Member. May I now call on Honorable Member for Sarah Kunda. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. COVID-19 is a pandemic. As we sit here, we are told that over 80,000 people in the United States are dead because of the virus. More than those who died in the Vietnam War. As the slogan used to go during HIV AIDS, we are either infected or affected. So it is significant that we undertook to hold this session by virtue of the demands of our times and circumstances. Honorable Speaker, we were informed by the state that a state of public emergency exists and is health emergency. And under Section 35, the state is empowered to rely on an act, and the act exists, to be able to make regulations, implement the regulations in order to address the pandemic. And we were approached by the state to extend the state of public emergency from the 26th of March for, 40, for 90 days, we gave them 45 days. In those 45 days, the state has the power to make regulations, but we are informed that the regulations must be of national. We are empowered to extend. And the state under Section 34.3 has authority to revoke what it has proclaimed. And this National Assembly also has power to revoke any resolution we pass. Here you have the steps having responsibility to guard the interests of the people. We are discussing about the Gambian people and their interests, how to safeguard it. That is the focus. That is why the state came with regulations. Four of them, when we sat in April, and an additional one after our city. When we gave the 45 days, we also passed a motion to set up a committee a special select committee that will have some of the following functions. Ensure the implementation by the executive of the state of public emergency within the remits of the law. Ensure that government provides the necessary mechanism for the implementation of the regulations. Of course, maybe we exceeded uh, the bounds of what is reasonable under those circumstances, because that is what we cannot ensure. Maybe we have chosen uh, other uh, phrases to be able to describe what we could do. But essentially, what we intended to do is to create a committee that will serve as oversight. 
and be able to follow up the process of implementation and report back to us after receiving the facts. In essence, we created a fact-finding mission that would be able to advise the National Assembly if there is need for the revocation or further extension of the state of emergency or for its extension. So essentially, we are given a report by the committee. We are told that the regulations were designed to combat the illness and defeat it. To do so, we need tools. And three fundamental tools are required. You need instruments. Those are the regulations. You need institutions. We'll see what the committee say about them. And you need normative practices that will lead to the change of mindsets so that we are able to serve the people by guiding them collectively towards what is essentially our common destiny being safeguarded. Honorable Speaker, if we look at the regulations, we'll start with them. The committee was assigned the responsibility to accompany the executive in ensuring that these regulations are implemented. These regulations are required by the Constitution to be reasonable and justifiable. So that is one assessment that would have to be done to gauge whether these regulations are fit for purpose. The essential commodities regulation powers was designed to carry out or to ensure that we uh, preserve essential commodities being available. Rice, maize, millet, flour, sugar, milk, bread, chicken, and on and on. All these are supposed to be available to ensure that they are here. They are essential. We need them. They should be available. And to ensure that they are available at reasonable prices, it also creates an element of price control. And to prevent control being abused, it bars hoarding of the goods. It ensuring to prevent one person buying bulk. So the regulation beat it, expo goods will be available. And to get an institution will implementation, it creates the essential committee, essential commodities control committee. And that committee is supposed to supervise the enforcement of the regulation. So it creates a committee. The Solicitor General is part of the committee. Director General of State Intelligence, part of the committee. Inspector General of Police, the Commissioner General, Gambia Revenue Authority, the Chief Executive Officer, Gambia Chamber of Commerce, the Executive Secretary, Gambia Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. The President Consumer Protection Consortium of the Gambia. So essentially, these are people who should monitor this regulation on a day-to-day -day basis so that it will be implemented as stipulated. So one would expect then that our committee will be able to meet this particular committee to find out what the challenges were and how they sought to address them. I have not seen that in the report. 
Honorable Speaker, I have also with me an Essential Commodities Emergency Powers Amendment Regulation 2020. And it was designed to amend what is already available. Somehow, page one, we've seen it mentioned about the open markets and also the driver of commercial vehicles because we've heard that people were exporting and now they are required to report uh, their whereabouts when they are carrying out these goods from the Greater Banjul area. And uh, they must not depart after 3 p.m., etc. So they must report to the police indicating uh, their destination, etc. So in short, the objective is to prevent the exportation of these goods. But the Attorney General, in his reply, may have to observe page two, where it says that may this day of 2020, no date. And there, I must emphasize again, Honorable Speaker, that we are supplied this document, but we should really start getting these documents directly from the government printers because they are the printers. And as an interested person, we've tried getting this regulation before parliament was convened, and we had to pay $230 for each copy. And this is just about four pages or something. That's clearly, I'm sure that will not be parliamentary, but four pages for $230. Is, is observed. And the Attorney General must begin to monitor what happens at the printers, whether they are in fact available. The confusion may not be between the two institutions that we are talking about, as we see, but sometimes at the source. We've been privileged to seek the documents at the source. And at a material time, we were not able to get it. So therefore, uh, we must ensure that these gazettes at proper sources must be available. And we will ultimately recommend that all government institutions become subscribers to the gazette so that they get direct copies once they are printed. That's the way to solve these problems. Because some of our institutions are actually working towards that direction. But here then, Honorable Speaker, there are impacts when you say we should not export. There are impacts to that. Because Gambia has always been benefiting from re exportation for its economy. And that is why the impact assessment is important. That this committee that is established is not only securing that essential commodities are available, but what is the impact of not exporting in the economy when we rely basically on the export trade uh, for importation of quite a lot of goods and therefore for access to, to revenue. Honorable Speaker, number two, there is the closure and restriction of non-essential public places emergency powers regulation. This regulation seeks to close bars, gymnasium, museums, nightclubs, etc., etc., etc. It also goes to restrict rules to five people, maintaining social distancing. It restricts public gathering uh, in, in restaurants, so that the restaurants, at least you buy takeaway and maintain social distancing. It uh, restricts public gathering in supermarkets so that there'll be uh, social distancing. Uh, saloons and barbershops, and essentially, that is the objective. Now, we must look at uh, this as a crime if you violate this, these laws, and therefore, uh, essentially, is the police that would be responsible as law enforcement officers, but specifically, uh, no guidance is given. And what should the police do 
if they are not trained on the regulation, how will they enforce it? Is it a special squad that will be created to actually deal with the regulations? Well, essentially, uh, if enforcement is a problem, then there is some element that uh, uh, we need to inject, that is the institutions that we can rely on to be able to handle the problem. There is the third one, restrictions on public transportation emergency powers regulation. This was designed to ensure that social distancing, uh, social distancing is maintained, what I call safe spacing, maintained in the transports, uh, and they should not carry more than half of what they are licensed to carry, and uh, ensure that if it is a, a vehicle with four passengers, that it carries only three, it goes on motor bicycles, you only uh, go alone or on less emergency, uh, medical issues, you can carry a second person. And it goes for the, uh, the freezing of commercial vehicles, fares, so that they will not increase again. And uh, it creates a machinery that the uh, public garages and, and stations and transport uh, uh, offices that the local government authorities of every region shall ensure that uh, there is the public garages and car parks are cleansed and disinfected at least twice a day and have hard hand washing facilities available in, and in all the areas, in, in, in those areas. So we, we are beginning to see responsibilities at the ferries, the canoes, they travel between 6 and 7 p.m., uh, maximum half, uh, essentially also protective gears being available. They must ensure that uh, they disinfect before every trip. Well, these are all responsibilities to be done. And the councils are given responsibility to ensure disinfecting those garages. Uh, air transport similarly that uh, where, where they come into the country, uh, they must have permit before arrival. Uh, they must, if it is a medical cargo, they must be qu quarantined uh, before departure. Uh, the airport and health authorities must be provided with hand sanitizers, hand, hand washing and protective uh, materials. Uh, they must check their temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People who arrive similarly must be checked and uh, eventually quarantine. Well, these are all responsibilities to be carried. They are an regulation, but the amendment basically is on the fares, increasing it. Uh, maybe they will explain to us where the thing is. Reduce it before. What has really happened is here is an income. That's, that's what the uh, amendment is all about. Uh, honorable Speaker, we looked at the next one, is the restriction of open markets and shopping areas, emergency powers regulation. So initially, this was meant for markets to open between 6 and 2 p.m. And then after opening, they must maintain social distancing, public hygiene, and that uh, it will be the responsibility of uh, the councils to disinfect the ma uh, markets after closure. And they were meant for those who will sell food and others were excluded. And within 100 meters, uh, people cannot sell within the 100 meters, but outside of that uh, radius, they will be able to uh, sell by maintaining social distancing. Now, it says that inspectors the local government authorities and the state security service shall designate their officers as inspectors to enforce this regulation. So here too, there is an element of amendment where now uh, one group, 6 to 1 p.m., and those who are selling non-food items will now be there 2 to 6 uh, uh, p.m. Now the issue is, when do you disinfect? When do you uh, sanitize and all those issues are left untreated? Now, what is the objective? 
is what we should look at. And I'll come uh, to that very soon. The last one, Honorable Speaker, came uh, after our last session. That is closure of educational institutions and places of worship, emergency powers regulation 2020. That did not exist before. That's why we said that there was no regulation closing mosques. But now they brought one and looking at, uh, again, uh, it's not even page, there's no paging, but there is no date to it. And maybe the Attorney General will help us later to understand what is really happening in this respect. So, but what is before us is closure of educational institution and places of worship. And what is honorable speaker is that it says that notwithstanding regulation two, which closes, an educational institution may be open for official use by its administrative staff. A mosque or a church may be open for the sole purpose of the call to prayer or a religious announcement of any other form. Why say you are closing something? When in reality you are saying, for a particular purpose, it will be open. What is the use of using the word closure, except to create confusion and misunderstanding? You do not close such institutions. You can regulate. These are easy matters to handle if we do so in good faith. Clear explanation of the illness. In fact, the religious leaders were the first to jump in explaining why preserving life is so fundamental to religion. So simply meeting them and discussing that, maybe the Mosque Committee, taking into consideration the importance of social, maybe the Mosque Committee, when it's called for prayer, will go there and call for prayer, and they, the Mosque Committee, can pray. So that you will not say that the mosque is, is closed, so that you will not say the church is closed. The key, the clergy, can handle that responsibility. They become the custodian of their mosque, custodian of their church and explain to their own people why this pandemic needs to be fought. What is so difficult? And we raised this, Honorable Speaker, when we had this session, that be imaginative, be creative, because the objective is to get the people to take ownership. If they don't take ownership, you will not succeed. And they don't want to die. But there's so much confusion that they have no direction. So therefore, what we put as law must not be something that is so disgusting to a person that the person will feel. When you say, I've closed a mosque, what does that mean to the person? You'll say that this is a draconian legislation. So what is important, Honorable Speaker, this must go. Nothing about closure mentioned when it comes to such institution. It should be regulation, some restriction. That is reasonable. And then to explain what form of restriction, as has been said, you discuss with those who are the custodians so that you reach an understanding why that is being done. Honorable Speaker, the regulation constitute the instruments that our committee should have really focused on to monitor how they are being implemented, the challenges of their imp implementation. If there are institutional gaps, the institution that should be created to do so. If there are financial gaps, the finances that were required. If there are material gaps, the material, because you need human resources, financial resources, material resources to be able to deal with any pandemic. So, Honorable Speaker, the committee has done its best, and our duty is to add value to the work we have started. The work we have started is to realize 
that it's not only the executive that has the responsibility of saving lives, but this National Assembly has the obligation to save lives. And we are competing with each other. And we should show that we are farmer, in fact, in our principles and in our objectives in ensuring that the lives of our people are not compromised. And that was the purpose of setting up such a committee to monitor the implementation of the regulations. Honorable Speaker, the committee has done the work of meeting ministries, meeting some organizations like the Gambia Chamber of Commerce, the Hotel Association, visiting markets, garages, border points with the objective of collecting facts. If we look at the facts, we will see that it informs us of what the gaps are. And I will want to deal with those gaps so that we'll go to the recommendations. Honorable Speaker, the key institution in fighting COVID-19 is the Minister of Health. At page nine, the committee explains the core institution that has been established to lead the fight. And that is the National Public Health Emergency Committee. The committee has identified that it has earmarked certain responsibilities to be carried out. And to do so, it emphasizes that they have created a special project account and that is open at the central bank. How much is in that account? What money is in that account? Well, our committee needs to provide us so that we understand uh, what this account is out to do and whether it has the financial wherewithal to be able to carry it out. But what they have identified as a source of finance is 500 million earmarked by the government. And this is supposed to go to the Ministry of Health, but they also emphasize that uh, it will not only cover health issues, it also may cover certain other matters. So they have uh, indicated that the uh, GCCI has provided 20 million, and they're supposed to build a 600 uh, patient or 600 bed, I guess. If they say accommodate 600 patients, which means a 600 bed uh, hospital in Sukuta. But the project does not come from funds raised by the ministry. So it means that uh, this 20 million is just from the GCCI. When is this project going to be completed? When will the beds be available? That is really uh, uh, the question, because we're dealing with an emergency. And from them, the statistics are already quoted. I don't need to go back into that. We know that we are faced with a crisis situation. Can you imagine 181,000 people being infected and they all live in a family setting? Who is left in the Gambia? All of us will be infected. So the more, I, I believe people have heard that that one worker infected 500 people in Ghana by working in a particular company. So it means that one person can infect 500 people. So this can spread like wildfire. And therefore, it is important that we take that into consideration and they have highlighted the dangers. If we ignore it, we do so at our own peril. The dangers are clearly highlighted by those who are specialists. They are our medical practitioners. If you are ill, you go to them. If you are ill, you go to them. What authority do you have to question their judgment? 
we have no authority, no legal authority to question their judgment. We can only assess their actions based on results. So, Honorable Speaker, they have told us the institution that is important uh, in that sense. And one would wonder at page 31, they continue to highlight the health dimension in the fight against COVID-19. Speaking to the Minister of Health, they have seen the issues of uh, equipment that are necessary. According to them, they have all the thermometers, 500, and they have others that they have ordered. In a way, they are, uh, they are justifying that they have the equipment necessary. So it is for them to indicate what they need. And when we look at the results, the impact assessment, well, we'll see whether the equipments that they have are serving the purpose for which they intend. The issue of their staff not being properly remunerated is clearly addressed at page 32. They are saying they give them 500, or it's 300, or it's 200. Are they satisfied with that? What queries, and this is a day, what queries do they have? We need to know. We need to deal with the staff to be able to gather the information that is necessary. So in the area of health, we've seen a machinery created an institution, but is that institution adequate? And I hope they will come and educate us. They are the one who told us, Honorable Speaker, that the illness by being exogenous had to be controlled from the borders. And that the first stage is screening. And they told us that it is this thermometer they had in the, at the borders, at the airports, to be able to screen. What did our committee discover? Are there Because that is the fight, that is the gun. You go to war without a gun, you are dead. So the frontline fighters are the health workers. Each of them should have this in your pocket, wherever they may be, so that they will be able to continue the screening. The screening does not mean you have it or you don't have it. What is a means of port of force call to deal with the illness. So it means that not only the health workers, but they must train the security personnel who will be incorporated in this fight to also be able to have this and use it. So can we really say that all health workers, or is it 10% of them, or 20% of them, or this uh, security personnel have this major instrument to fight this war? We want to know that. And this need to be, a database must be created for it, so that we know that this is what is available. Then we know our limitation, then we know how to augment to be able to fight our limitation. Otherwise, how can we fight? We must have facts. We fight with facts. Honorable Speaker, not only that, it is important to again gather from them. They tell us that some people are asymptomatic. And they come and they don't reflect all that screening. How efficiently are we controlling the borders so that whoever come in, at least you, 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 you move to, to the other dimension of being controlled for a period or even being tested. They need to come up and tell us their policy that do you move from just screening to testing? What does that entail? We need to know that. Do they have the capacity to do that mass testing? That is important. Honorable Speaker, they are the ones who also told us that once they discover certain symptoms, you must be quarantined. You must be taken to a place and kept there. We have seen the, the, the amount of money that is now being paid in the addendum 
to the hotels that uh, I don't need to go into that. We, we, we all have the document. You can see that they are being quarantined in hotels. And millions are being paid to maintain them. Catering has to be done. Millions are being paid for catering. Is that sustainable? So don't you see the need that we must move toward the preventive dimension? Because if we move further and further into quarantining, the more expenditure, and at the end of the day, that is not sustainable. So it is important, therefore, we look at that. Their own line of thinking is that you move from screening and actually observatory to take you to quarantine you so that they can observe you. If they discover, then they treat you. Now, the treatment centers, we have seen MRC telling us that they have 42 beds so that I can speed up the process. And that in Kenaba, I believe they, say have, they have 10. And another place is, is like MRC is preparing itself for those number of beds. But what do we have? Sukuta? And which other quarantine center, uh, which other treatment, uh, uh, treatment center? I don't want to mention. These are the things that we need to have. And the places where people are being treated, their location. I don't want to get into that substance. I'm sure we should be able to get into that. What facility have we provided from the Ministry of Health to be able to do the, the treatment, the actual curing of the person? That is very significant. So to conclude the health sector, Honorable Speaker, we had talked about an interministerial task force because you are talking about finance, you are talking about environment, you are talking about the border, etc. All these people must concerned not only at the level of a task force of officers under a WHO and a minister, but interministerial. Maybe it exists. We need to get that information so that they'll be able to sit down and look at these issues before regulations. They will be able to consult. Then we will not come and so one institution say, I don't even know about the regulation. Who consulted who? And how can there be that without that, that, that proper consultation at that high level? So that is, that is fundamental in our recommendation. If it does not exist, it should exist. Because the right hand must know what the left hand is doing. Otherwise, you cannot have complementarity in action. Honorable Speaker, they have looked at institutions like trade. The committee wanted to know where the essential goods would not fall short of our needs. And we have seen the ministry talking about 37,000 tons, eventually dropping to 23,000 tons. I'm now quoting stat statistics of head because I don't want to go out and continue looking. So if I have any error in that, uh, just, uh, you, you can rectify it. But essentially that huge drop, and they could only attribute it that some exportation was taking place. So it is important then to look at who the importers are because you control the stock. And how will your stock miss? So it is essential to, 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 to be able to have a regulation in, in being able to deal with those stocks to ensure that that exportation does not take place in the, in, in the first place. Honorable Speaker, it has also indicated the need to look what is available. Have they actually examined whether there are stocks of rice in the country that people have produced? stocks of goods in the country that people have produced, that there is need for internal assessment of what is available locally, and if need be, purchase those ones in, in the localities before we start you know, importing and say we are distributing. Some people may have stock of, 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 the, of this food at the local level, which we can purchase at the local level. So it is important then that uh, an impact assessment is done at that particular level also. Honorable Speaker, there is the Ministry of Tourism. 
indicating the drop anticipated in, in, in the tourist industry. And the losses that are anticipated, 6.7 billion, that's not an ordinary sum, which is going to affect the hotels, the restaurants, the lodges, it's going to affect every sector of, 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 of the tourism. They're talking about 100,000 young people being late of work. 100,000 young people being late of work. So, the Honorable Speaker, uh, we look at the issue of uh, works and communication. We, 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 we see the incoming flights that all these public enterprises, GIA, etc., will be grossly affected by the current situation. The Hajj flight will be suspended. They are talking about over 200 million. So essentially, we are talking about an impact assessment of millions that are going to be lost. And Honorable Speaker, I will beg uh, to ask the committee chair to uh, tell me why he would put the state owned enterprises in that uh, whole bag of providing funds of relief uh, for, for the state. It seemed like uh, quite a number of them are going to suffer tremendous losses uh, because of, of, of the current situation, where there's ferries, etc. So uh, we would want, ultimately, uh, in their recommendation to, to activate uh, certain committees to look into this, to zero into this, to, so that proper impact assessment can be done, the threats properly seen for, for the government uh, you've seen Minister of Finance uh, indicating that the 35 million that had been given in terms of dealing with, with the state-owned enterprises at least is being converted in some way to be able to deal with COVID-19. So these are issues that we need to look at concretely in terms of the short, medium and long-term impact on the economy and on those institutions and their survival. Honorable Speaker, uh, we have looked at their findings at the borders, uh, at the uh, markets, etc. What I have not seen, Honorable Speaker, is talking to the market committees, uh, talking to the unions. I've seen the Gambia Chamber of Commerce. I don't want to accuse the committee of uh, being uh, business buyers and not workers uh, focus, but I, I see absence in that, that really uh, the unions, where there's motor drivers, etc. all these people should have been contacted uh, to be able to understand the impact. And consumer uh, societies, all these people need to be uh, contacted to see the impact uh, on, 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 on all sectors of society. Honorable Speaker, the key institution that can facilitate the success of the fight is the Minister of Finance. And page six of the report tells us what the ministry uh, has actually been doing. And the finance revealed that 500 million pledged to the Minister of Health, 172 million had already been paid, uh, that 100 million uh, out of the 172 was added to the grant approved by the World Bank towards the procurement of ambulance and so on and so forth, all equivalent to 12 billion. So essentially, it is important to see uh, exactly the resource base of COVID-19. And we hope that ultimately uh, we will put all the resources together First and foremost, we've heard from the health committee indicating the special fund that is created. We need to look at this issue of special funds. We have also seen your report, especially the addendum, and it is very clear. For me, that was my major concern, and uh, we thank the committee that that element is now very clear. 
Uh, we are only told that there is environment, environment, environment. But uh, how did they get the 500 million? And what is clear from uh, what they have received, the memo they received, the committee received from the ministry, is that the office of the president had environment on travel of 20 million. PMO uh, training, uh, 70 million. National Audit Office, uh, travel, uh, 16 million. Minister of Health, 50 million on consultancy. Uh, centralized services, uh, that is 150 million. Minister of Environment, uh, OMVG, 100 million. O OVP, uh, about two, 2 million. So the National Assembly, uh, well, PMO, 1 million. National Assembly, 4 million, that is travel. Judiciary, 2 million. PSC, 1 million. Tourism, 1 million. Justice, 1 million. Uh, Minister of uh, Finance and Economic Affairs, 20, uh, 2 million. Uh, we have agriculture, 2 million. Trade, 1 million. Health, 2 million. Environment, 1 million. Mosi, 500,000. Fisheries, 1.5 million. Mohas, 1 million. Moxwell, 500,000. Health, uh, 70 million. So in essence, that is 500 million. So we are being told that uh, that's where the environment actually comes. And let's look at section 29 of the Public uh, Finance Act in terms of environment to see whether uh, what has happened is actually uh, the right thing that should happen and what lessons could we draw from it. Now, Section 29 provides three foundations, three pillars for violence. Subsection 2, Section 4 states that uh, there can be violence among expenditure items of a budgetary agency, which means you have a budgetary agency, a ministry, national assembly, these are all budgetary agencies. So you can have a environment of items of budget within a budgetary agency, so it goes from one to the other. Or among budgetary agencies, under the same supervising department, you have a department, three departments under a ministry, well, it's the same budgetary agency, so you can have environment between uh, the fronts of those departments. But among budgetary agencies, by the approval of the minister, in consultation with the vote controller of budget agencies. So what has actually happened here is environment across budgetary agencies. And if the minister had consulted with the board controllers, it is perfectly in order. But if the minister has not done that, then the minister should accept that there has been oversight and then this assembly should be assured that as long as the Public Finance Act exists, that uh, will be respected you know, from henceforth. But essentially, we must look at what uh, has also been said by the, the Minister of Finance. They've indicated that in terms of the funds that they have received, from the World Bank that is actually given to the Central Bank. And that uh, when it's given to the Central Bank, then in reality, the Central Bank will actually lend to the Ministry, and in that sense, they have no authority to control uh, what the Central Bank does. That is how it is put here. I'd like uh, the Minister eventually to really explain the uh, rapid credit facility, uh, there must have been some form of agreement between the IMF and the government, whether it was 20th century, 19th century, 18th century, but there must have been an agreement. And it is only the existence of that agreement, that parent agreement, that should be able to ensure uh, such development in terms of funds going into an account and being utilized without coming to the National Assembly. So we would request for the minister to search for that parent agreement so that we ultimately know from which 
provision uh, that this particular practice is, is, is emerging from. Without that, then we have to sit down and really look at the practice and then uh, make sure that the practice is, is fit for purpose. That is the purpose of the exercise, Honorable Speaker, that we are here to look at COVID-19 from the perspective of the national interest. As it stands, our committee has made recommendations and I will propose that we take this report, not as the final report, if the committee chairs and members agree, but as a preliminary report, which should be beefed up by debriefing of all the elements that are here so that a seasoned recommendation, a robust recommendation could be made uh, that will come in the form of a resolution that the National Assembly uh, will adopt. Uh, that this is important that we now have the facts. What is important now is to rely on the facts to ensure that we build the mechanism that will be able to fight the fight so that we can be victorious at the end. And I hope the ministry will see, the especially health, will see the vacuum. The vacuum in building up that institutional framework for the fight. I have not seen any layer of bringing the experts in the country and mobilizing them so that we build up an observatory for disease control on a permanent basis. There should be an objective of having a permanent observatory for disease control, which will definitely be guided and directed by a team of experts who will facilitate the building of the institution itself and then train that the Gambians will be able to run the institution. That is really important at, at this stage. I have also not seen that whole plan of ensuring that testing throughout the country is done with immediacy. There are plans, but we want something concrete and time bound so that we see that this is exactly what is going to happen in two weeks, three weeks, a month. So, don't come to us this time and ask for extension of state of emergency without concretely saying, this is what we can achieve. And this is what we want to achieve concretely. And this is what is going to be visible. So in that sense, we'll be able to move forward. If they have that, then we should be able to give them 45, whatever number of days. But if they don't have that, you may end up with 25 days, you may end up with, because still we need to check whether you are fit for purpose, whether you are ready to fight this fight and lead us to fight. That must, we must be convinced. And the regulations also must now be built up on the basis of consultation so that we do not offend sensibilities. It is said that the regulations must be reasonable and justifiable in a democratic society. And lastly, Honorable Speaker, there is an extension mandate of other elements that should be taken into consideration. If you look at Section 36 of the Constitution, it also goes to protect those people who may be arrested and detained under a state of emergency and make it a requirement to report to the National Assembly on those who are detained and, and, and uh, during a state of public emergency. So, we hope that the minister will go into the whole uh, issue of, of protection of fundamental rights and checking whether there is need for those tribunals to be established because it demands tribunal to be established to look at certain cases which deal with emergency powers because emergency powers are not ordinary powers. They are dealing with other issues. So uh, do you need to create that special tribunal? So it is important that we look at this uh, with greater uh, insight and hopefully we'll be able to create the machinery to be able to advance the cause of fighting COVID-19 and exterminate it before it exterminates us. Thank you.